There's a storm across the valley The clouds are rolling in The afternoon is heavy on your shoulders There's a truck out on the four lane A mile or more away The whining of his wheel just makes it colder. We've just arrived here at the Historical Society and Museum in Easton, and we're going to do a little tour for our viewers so they see all of the treasures that are assembled here. And my name is Priscilla Almquist Olson, your host for Community Forum, and uh, Ken Michael is the current and past president of the Easton Historical Society and Museum, and he's going to show us. Uh, all of the exhibits, and hopefully you will be as intrigued as we are every time we visit. So let's go. Okay, well, here we are at the entrance to the railroad station, and just by a little bit of quick history, the railroad station was designed by H.H. H. Richardson with landscaping by Frederick Law Olmsted, and the station was built uh, over the period 1881 to 1883. Uh, it is of locally sourced stone and is designed in the Richardson Romanesque style. Here in the, and it ran as a railroad station from roughly 1883 until roughly 1963 when the last freight train came through. The last passenger train actually came through in about 1959. Now, if you were using the railroad station uh, at any time during that period of time, you would have come in through the door immediately behind me into this entryway. Uh, and you would have gone either to the right, which is the men's side, or to the left, which is the women's side. And here in the entryway, we have a number of exhibits and artifacts that have come from a variety of places. Uh, if we look up over my head immediately, uh, you'll notice one of the newest ones, which is a 38-star flag, uh, for, which was 1876 to 1889, that flag was a gift of two of our retiring members and most important members, Ed Hands and Frank Menino. Uh, just recently, uh, August, September of 2022. Uh, you'll notice on either side that there are road markers uh, for up on, uh, on Bay Road. And the one to the right is more easily read. Uh, it says, uh, to Taunton, 27, 26 and a half miles to Boston, 1773, and then uh, kind of indecipherable, but the town of Easton. Um, over to the right is an original uh, sign for the John J. McCarthy and Company freight terminals, which were located in Taunton, Mass., uh, and then various businesses here, uh, J.E. Ghost and Easton. Uh, these are just replicas for the for example, the McCarthy freight system over here, uh, and uh, one of the Boston and Albany trains. There's a variety of photographs, early photographs of both the center of Northeastern and the train station and trains coming in and out. To our right is a picture of the gentleman, Frederick Lothrop Ames, uh, who actually financed uh, and <clears throat> commissioned the building of this station, which he later sold to the Old Colony Railroad. Uh, immediately below that, there are a number of um, plaques, uh, the most important of which are the National Historic Landmark plaque. Uh, the station became a National Historic Landmark in 1987. Uh, it's part of the Northeastern Historic District, which encompasses many of the Richardson buildings here. Uh, just below that, there's a plaque in appreciation to the Ames and Parker family, which is a rededication in November 7th of 2009. The Ames and Parker families donated the station in 1969 to the Eastern Historical Society. In fact, it was in November of 69. Uh, and later, you'll see a plaque from a rededication for 50 years uh, in November of 2019. Um, over to my left, you see an original sign from the Grange, Kimball Hall Harmony Grange, 
1907. The Grange Building is located down on Route 138, uh, right next to the uh, uh, Ski Doo and uh, Spillane's Union Villa. So if you want a pizza, that's the place to go. However, the Harmony Grange uh, is located in, I think, on Prospect Street. It's now a, a family home residence. Um, and the other Grange was the Eastern Grange, and that's the one that Ken is talking about next to uh, that's correct. Buddy's Villa. Um, but the Harmony Grange uh, was one of two Granges. As you can imagine how popular the Granges were, they, this town uh, during those years in the 19th and uh, 18th, 19th century were, were uh, agricultural. So, um, yep. They were so, a great social and agricultural organization. A, a great social and agricultural organization. Right. A and, a, and a great community center. Um, over here on the right, we have uh, a cabinet that's full of various bottles. If you look in the down, down below, those bottles are from local dairies of all various kinds. Uh, and then there are a variety of bottles at the top, which are medicinal, for medicinal purposes only. Uh, a large degree of alcohol and other types of ingredients were in those bottles. <laughs> and then you'll see three photographs here of prize-winning cattle. Uh, the major one in the middle, uh, which is uh, uh, Dolly Dimple, was a prize-winning uh, 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 cow for, for the Ameses. Ames, Ames family raised uh, prize winning cattle and they, for they, a number of years. Yeah, excuse me. And they raised um, Guernsey cows. And uh, Guernsey is a place in England. And of course, the Ames family originated in England. So the Guernsey cows, uh, and, and they uh, had a, uh, I believe, here's the, um, um, the bull. Thank you. <laughs> And that prize bull uh, is is the probably head of the the whole family, right? The cows. He had he, he had a hand, so to speak, in that. Yes, he did. <laughs> yeah. He did. Um, just up over the door here in front of us uh, is the listing of the stops for the train, uh, which will be coming through here. You can see, starting in Braintree, ending up in Taunton, and of course you had the reverse. Uh, in front of us, which is, is the station master's office, which we, uh, is, is currently undergoing a, re, uh, a reorganization, so we're not going to go in and look at that at the moment. Um, now, when you came into the station, you went to the right or the left. To the right, you were in the men's section, and to the left, you're in the ladies' section. Uh, I'm going to take you into the ladies' section first, and uh, just to... Uh, let you know what we're doing now. It's not just ladies and men. Uh, the men's section is going to is is dedicated to the Easton's industrial history, um, and the ladies section is dedicated to the cultural and social history uh, of Easton. And I'll take you through there first, so we can look at some of the exhibits in here. Now. Each side is identical. Uh, you have an, an exit door so that you can go out onto the platform when the train comes. And you also have a ticket window over here to my right, uh, which is where you purchased your tickets. There's the same thing on the, on the men's side. Um, the exhibits here cover a wide variety of things. Uh, as you can see, there's music. Uh, and over here, we have some photographs of Mr. Robert King and his dad. Uh, Mr. King, whose photograph is here uh, to my left, used to conduct band concerts down at the Rockery. If you were going by the Rockery and you see where the flag is, you'll see where the band uh, concerts used to be held. Uh, there was a gazebo and a bandstand there. Uh, secondly, if you look up on the wall, uh, in both that photo, in that photograph, he's Mr. King is playing a sousaphone. Well, there's his sousaphone up there on the wall, uh, and uh, just below is a picture of Mr. King's son, Robert King, uh, in 1933. The exhibits here cover uh, in front of me immediately. Uh, 
medicine. This is a medical exhibit that's an original doctor's bag and a variety of uh, uh, drugs and potions and uh, medicines that were designed to cure everything as long as you could cure it with either uh, cocaine, codeine, or something of that nature. Uh, here we have an exhibit in the middle which is dedicated to Oaks and Blanche Ames and Borderland. This was the uh, creation of our interim curator, Ariel Nathanson. Over to our right, we have a, an exhibit of athletic, not only equipment, but um, a trophy, uh, different types of citations, programs. Uh, that's an original cheerleader sweater up on top of the cabinet uh, and an original foot, Olive Reigns football helmet. Uh, there's a set of boxing gloves over there that are reputed or, or alleged to have been used by Rocky Marciano. I think more likely they were used by one of his sparring partners uh, <laughs> at the time. The Eastern Brass Band drum at the top was part of the, uh, the King Band and uh, that had been located in Maine, actually by uh, Hazel Varela, who brought it back and it has been recently restored. Over here to your, in front of me on this wall here, this is, this is basically all of the items that we would have for sale. Publications, puzzles, hats, uh, Christmas ornaments, CDs, etc. cetera. Uh, and this whole display set up here for from the left to the right had been set up by uh, John Coe, who has a, a very extensive merchandising background and did a really nice job with that. As you can see on the wall, we have various photographs. Um, one of them is by a local artist, Mary Bodio, and it depicts all of the Richardson buildings and several other uh, items here in the Northeastern Village. Uh, over to the right, there is a watercolor of the 400 Club, which used to be located down on Route 138 where the CVS is currently located. Uh, as you scan through the room here, you'll notice there's a an athletic jacket over here on the mannequin, and that's a field hockey jacket that had been owned by Pat Gurney Baker, who was one of our directors who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, member of the class of 1958 at uh, Oliver Ames. Um, this is a genuine Oliver Ames cheerleader megaphone, just basically to get the fans all excited and get them cheering and rooting for their teams. Up above the door, we have an Ames family shovel uh, it's probably going to move to the other side fairly soon, but that shovel was made by David Ames Sr. in 1935 uh, after he went to work, uh, after graduating uh, from business school. He worked in the uh, shovel shops, and uh, he worked for about nine months on the production line. Uh, and that may be one of the last shovels actually made by an Ames family member. Over here... In front of us, we have a buffet, which is one of the, uh, I believe came from Governor Ames' estate at one point in time. Uh, and the most notable item on the wall in front of us is what may very well be the oldest window in Easton. Um, this window was made somewhere in the 16th century. Uh, it's in the Tudor style, and it came from the Edward Hayward House. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's movable. We can open it up, pull it away. You can look at it from both sides. You can pretend you're looking out the window in the 16th century or the 17th because it's been around since then. Uh, and we can put it right back. Since this is a train station, we've at various points put up trains, all of which were, we have found in, on the second floor in various areas. And uh, because we're curating, editing, and trying to utilize as many of the items which we have here, 
these trains are taking a, uh, a prime spot. This is the industrial side. Uh, and one of the things and one of the purposes here is that we show that there are industries which were operated and thrived here in Easton uh, in addition to the Ames Shovel and Tool Corp. In many cases, they were uh, worked with them. For example, we have the Belcher Iron Works, uh, which are located up on Pequ up off of Pequonic on Route 106, just near Pequonic at Ave, up in the Furnace Village. Uh, that's how Furnace Village got its name, because you had the iron furnaces up in that particular area. We have Daniel Belcher, who was the founder. That's his desk right there in front of us. Um, and we also have uh, various items that were utilized from, by the Ames companies, Ames Plow to our right. Uh, there's the Ames Plow. That's a, uh, over here, different things. That's a, 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 an anvil. Uh, there's a grinding wheel. Uh, a roller, the roller on the right, the wooden roller on the right. I'm not exactly sure what that was used for, but it could have been used to roll out metal or it could have been used to roll out uh, stone and, and asphalt. I'm just not sure what that was used for exactly. Um, in front of the ticket window here, uh, I'm just going to point out uh, that's the, the flag in honor of Ken Martin, who was a longtime member uh, who died about uh, eight or 10 years ago. Uh, and he was, he was instrumental uh, in the society uh, in starting up the, uh, the bottle drive. Uh, and he and Frank Menino worked on that for quite a while. Over here to the right, you can see a picture of a gentleman, John Ames Mitchell. John Ames Mitchell was the architect of the Unity Church, which is located up on Main Street. Uh, and there's a photograph of Unity Church to the right of uh, John Ames Mitchell's picture. Now, here in this display case, uh, we have several things. On the top is an old Philco radio from roughly 1935, I believe. And um, it doesn't work at the moment, but I believe it could. And just below in the case, on the left side of the case, we have the old Colony Street Railroad and items uh, and photographs that were dedicated to the railway. Uh, it was the uh, Taunton Street Railway Company, Taunton Division, Old Colony Street Railway Company, to be exact. To the right of that, in the display case, we have instruments which were manufactured uh, here in Easton by the J.M. Poole Company. Uh, they, they specialized in various types of measuring devices, uh, for example, uh, compass, thermometer, uh, level, et cetera. All very, very highly, uh, high quality manufactured uh, implements used throughout the world. They were located up near route, uh, the uh, regional high school on Route 106 uh, on the opposite side of the street. I'm not exactly sure. That it's a little bit of question as to which houses and I'm not exactly sure which one. Uh, we have here a steam engine which was designed by Alfred Bryant Morse, uh, and this in, in 1881, and it was used along with some larger ones uh, to power boats for the main, mainly. And um, he was in partnership uh, with some of the Ameses at the time, and they were saying they they test test drove these boats all on uh, the Morse Pond, which is located behind the CVS. Uh, You'll note to the right here, we have an exhibit uh, from an ongoing business, which is the Simpson Spring Company, located down off of 138 uh, in Southeastern, and uh, various advertisements and artifacts and so forth. In fact, one of our former presidents, uh, Ed White, was the president of the Simpson Spring Company. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, here we have another grinder that was made by the Ames Plow Company, uh, and that was a company that was owned by the Ames family as well. Looking back, 
you can see there are photographs and, and paintings above. And you'll notice one is of Oaks Ames to the very left. The other is the Honorable Oliver Ames, who was the governor of Massachusetts, uh, 1887 to 1889. And uh, this also here uh, is his desk. And um, there are a lot of political uh, publications located here, uh, mainly uh, advertisements um, and copies of tickets that would have been voting tickets for uh, the Republican Party uh, since Governor Ames was a Republican. There's also a couple of uh, three photographs here for the governor. This is his desk, the desk he worked at uh, when we were when he was uh, governor. Here above, we have uh, a variety of, of things on the wall here. There are the, the one in the middle, Aim Shovel and Tool Company. Now that was, that particular, it's a, a collage, was given to uh, managers who performed admirably during the particular year uh, at their business at the factories. Now, it has an illustration of each factory that the Ames Shovel and Tool Company had, and right in the center at the top uh, is a picture of the Ames Corporate Headquarters, which is located in Boston uh, at the intersections of State Court and Washington Street. It's, the building is still there. Immediately behind it is City Hall Plaza in Boston. Off to the right, we have a, a depiction uh, of the driving of the Golden Spike uh, when it completed the unification of the Transcontinental Railroad between East and West. Um, and you can see one of the, uh, it looks like one of the Ames is driving the spike into the, uh, into the tracks. Then there's various marketing items here for the Ames Shovel and Tool Company, such as this red <clears throat> steel um, advertisement for new aim shovels with a lock socket. Uh, just below, there's another depiction of the um, shovel factory in here in Northeastern, which currently uh, is has been re repurposed into apartment into an apartment complex. Uh, also, one of the buildings was repurposed into the YMCA, which is on the other side of the street. Along the sides of the desk are the busts of Oliver and Oaks Ames, along with the original founder, Oliver Ames, of the Ames Shovel and Tool Company. Here we have a marketing display of shovels from the Ames Shovel and Tool Company. Uh, each of these shovels depicts a different evolution in the use or the manufacture of the shovel um, from the earliest wooden shovels right up into the military style shovels that are shown on the wall there. And on the wall, uh, framing the windows, are various types of shovels that were manufactured by the AIM Shovel and Tool Company for various uses. Gardening, shoveling coal, uh, shoveling uh, asphalt, making roads, those kinds of things. Just below, we have a series of photographs, and these photographs are <coughs> set up so that you have an older photograph and a newer photograph. Um, the, older, the newer photographs were taken by one of our directors and our second vice president, John Coe. Um, the older photographs are photographs from our collection, uh, and you can see the difference between the two as you go along and look at them. And these are a permanent exhibit, and uh, anyone can come in at any time and see these photographs. Up above, there are pict further pictures of the buildings that were designed uh, by Henry Hobson Richardson. The building to the left is the old bank building just across from the Rockery uh, and Oaks Ames Hall. That was actually not designed by Richardson personally, but by his successor firm, Shepley Bullfinch architectural firm. The um, picture in the middle, which is the gardener's cottage, which is 
just beyond the uh, gate lodge to Lang uh, gate lodge, which is the entrance to Langwater. Uh, that's one of the few wooden buildings ever designed by Richardson. And then we have Mr. Richardson himself here in the middle uh, in one of the few pictures that I've seen of him where he's actually dressed in a coat and vest, etc. Uh, you usually see him in some sort of a, uh, uh, an exotic garb like dressed as a monk. Um, he was a bit different uh, as well as a great architect. Over here to our right, we have uh, a picture of Frederick Law Olmsted, who was responsible for a lot of the landscaping for many of the buildings here, including the railroad station when they were built. And he worked in partnership with Richardson for a very long time until Richardson's death. Richardson predeceased him. Last but not least, we have here the 1899 Morse car. The Morse car was designed by Alfred Bryant Morse. He started designing it in 1896, and he completed it in 1899. This car is a prototype. It was never sold. Uh, it has a two-cylinder air-cooled engine. As you can see, it is designed much like a horse and buggy because that's what the styling was at the time, um, and that's what he had to work with. Uh, it's interesting, it has an adjustable steering wheel. It does not have a battery. Uh, the spark plugs are ignited by a magneto. The lights are powered by kerosene. So there was no electricity in this car other than a very minute amount uh, to get the spark plugs going. Um, and the top speed of this car if it were operating, would have been somewhere in the range of about 30 to 35 miles an hour. Uh, one of the interesting things about the car is that the tires, uh, and these are replica tires, uh, have no tread on them because there were no roads. They were driving on fields. If this car were out there to drive on fields, rocky streets, etc. cetera. So, uh, and these are uh, pneumatic tires. Um, and we just, we received this car probably about four years ago now, uh, just prior to the uh, pandemic. Uh, and we'd had it stored up at uh, Sundell's through the generosity of Bob Sundell up until approximately a year ago uh, when um, the car was brought over here. In a we put it into a storage facility here. Uh, it was taken apart and uh, by a team spearheaded by John Coe, uh, Ed Hands, who uh, recorded all of, all of the parts and cataloged, videotaped, et cetera. Um, it was a very interesting uh, project because at one point in time, we had the car disassembled, all of the parts were here in this room, uh, and then they had to be reassembled after we brought the body and the chassis into the uh, station. We brought them in through the entrance door right over there. Uh, they had to come in one at a time. Uh, and the tricky part was getting the body in after it was taken from the chassis because the body is like moving a mattress. It's flexible. So we had to keep it very, very stiff and solid coming through the door um, or else it would have cracked and broken. Uh, the car is in great shape. It could actually run if we made a few adjustments to the engine, uh, but we do not plan on doing that. And it's a permanent exhibit here uh, at the station. The, uh, the car, as I said, wasn't sold. It's one of two uh, examples of Morse cars that are in existence. The other is a, a I believe it's a 1910 uh, car, which is located down in New Jersey in a private collection. The, Morse cars were sold from 1901 through 1918. Uh, production stopped in 1918 when the United States entered World War I because uh, the steel for the cars was bought from the German, German steel firm of Krupp. And of course, no, no steel from Krupp could be imported into the US after that. Um, this is a, a magnificent example uh, of American creativity, ingenuity, uh, and uh, certainly a tribute to uh, Mr. Morse's 
uh, intellect. Mr. Morse uh, had an eighth grade education, uh, but I guess he's evidence that education doesn't make, necessarily make you smart. It just helps you if you are smart or it helps you to get smart. But he was, a, uh, he was quite a guy and he was quite inventive. Uh, the Easton Machine Company, which his family owned, uh, which was located uh, just beyond, on Depot Street, just beyond the CVS. Uh, the buildings are still there. If you take a right at Hennessy's Liquor Store, you can, you'll find it um, on both sides of the street. And um, they also made uh, machinery that did things like wove linen, uh, made taffy candy. Uh, they were they were very very uh, uh, varied in the machinery that they made. Another Eastern uh, in industry. Okay, well, Ken Michael, president of the Eastern Historical Society and Museum, thank you so much for giving us this very informative uh, tour. Um, you know every bit and piece of this place. And we appreciate all of that knowledge that you've shared with our viewing audience today. So thank you again, Mr. You're, Michael. You're welcome, Priscilla. You're very, very welcome. Thank you for having us on your program. Uh, and I would like to say just one thing that is we are open three days a week, every week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 to 4. We're also open uh, the second or third Sunday of the month for an open house. And anytime you see the flag that says open outside or you're going by and you see the lights on, you're certainly welcome to come on in, look around. And, and, and anybody who's here, either myself or Ariel Nathanson, the curator, or any member of the board of directors who happens to be here at that time, will be more than happy to give anyone interested a tour or explain any, any questions that anyone may have. And one final word, uh, if you are going through uh, some loved one's things at the end of their life and you find documents or uh, items that pertain to Easton's history, uh, please don't throw them in the dumpster. Bring them to the Eastern Historical Society and Museum uh, to see if uh, they can use them, If Maybe they have duplicates and you can keep them in your own family, but think about donating them. Uh, I certainly have come here many, many times uh, because I now am assured that these historical documents and items will be preserved for future generations education uh, and enlightenment. So again, thank you for watching. Priscilla Almquist Olson with Ken Michael today at the Railroad Depot the Eastern Historical Society and Museum home, to which we hope you all come and often and enjoy. Thank you for watching. Until next time, be well.